Good morning. I'm glad some of you remember to set your clock. <laughs> we, uh, I, for me, I, we switch over on Friday because it's hard. You all switch over on Sunday and then go to work on Monday. When we switch over on Saturday night and come to work on Sunday, it's hard. So we switch on Friday. We actually Friday evening, so it makes it a little easier for us on Sunday. And that way I know I don't forget to either be here on time or, you know, not be an hour late or an hour early. Anyway, glad you're here uh, this morning. Good to be together and uh, glad that you still have uh, confidence in South Jefferson, our ability to sanitize. I know that the uh, numbers are increasing in Louisville, but I'm, I'm grateful that you feel that this is a safe place to come and you're still in worship and that's a good sign. Grateful for the, the level of giving. I don't know if y'all noticed in the bulletin, uh, last week over $4,000 was contributed to our, our general fund. And so y'all, are that's phenomenal. You all, thank you for your faithfulness and giving. Thank you for your faithfulness and connecting together and stay in touch with one another uh, while we're uh, apart. And so many people don't feel safe getting out or coming to, you know, into a building with other people. So thank you for your faithfulness to stay connected together uh, as well. You all are to be commended. There are churches in trouble everywhere uh, of all sizes, uh, big churches and, and medium-sized churches and small churches. And I, I'm so grateful for uh, your faithfulness and commitment to South Jefferson that we are not in any kind of uh, difficult situation. You are to be highly, highly commended for your faithfulness. And I, I certainly appreciate it. And I know that it's a testimony uh, to your faith and to your commitment to be uh, faithful to the Lord in all aspects of your life. And so I'm extremely grateful uh, for that. Did you say you had an announcement, Jacqueline? Do you want to do it now or later? Or? I just wanted to remind everybody about how we're going to do our Samaritan's Purse outreach this year. That's normally our shoebox collection that we do in November. Um, and remember, we normally do those shoeboxes to provide for children around the world. They get the shoebox as a present at Christmas, and it also comes with the message of the gospel, and that's shared with them as the Samaritan's Purse Ministry distributes those around the world. So this year, just because COVID-19 has made some things uh, a little bit different, we are going to change the way that we as a church are serving in that shoebox ministry. And so we've chosen to participate this year by providing the funding for Samaritan's Purse to do shoeboxes. And so it costs about $25 uh, to do one shoebox for a child. And so as a church, we're going to take an offering next week and the week after, so November 8th and November 15th, we're going to collect for Samaritan's Purse. And um, for every $25 that we collect as a church, we'll be able to sponsor a shoebox as a church. So um, if you want to participate in that, when you drop in the offering plate, which you know we have in, in the back behind you on both sides, when you do that on the 8th and on the 15th, you can write a separate check uh, made out to the church. So do make that out to South Jefferson. Um, for however much you want to donate to Samaritan's Purse and just put that in uh, the, the memo line of your check. So you can put Shoebox Ministry or Samaritan's Purse. And then as a church, we're going to send one large gift um, to the Samaritan's Purse organization. Um, so if you have any questions about how to participate in that or how those things are working out this year, um, please feel free to talk to Jenny Arnold. Um, remember when we participate in Samaritan's Purse, that's a WMU sponsored project. So we have two weeks, the 8th and the 15th, that we're going to collect for that um, to try to be a blessing to children around the world and also share in the spread of the gospel. Thank you. All right, good deal. It's good to know that uh, WMU is still active and that our church is still active in ministry even during the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I'm grateful for what our folks did on Wednesday evenings with our, our youth and children's uh, ministry. We did a, a pilot for five weeks uh, to try to reach these kids and I think the, the first Wednesday we had 13 children and by the time it was over we were consistently seeing 18 uh, kids there and workers were in addition to that. So about 24, 25 people all together involved uh, c connecting with the kids in our community, uh, which was wonderful. Uh, th that team of people is to be commended. It was a, 
uh, Charles and, and Jacqueline, she led music out there on Wednesday night. They set up the screen and, and had a worship time out there. Uh, Charles and Logan and TJ uh, really drove it and then had other people that volunteered to work. Myra and, and Margaret made sure that the kids were fed uh, a meal every Wednesday and uh, so grateful for that. Uh, and it, it speaks to this community's desire to be connected with our church. I mean, and, uh, as the weeks went on, the kids learned better about how to behave and, and how to stay social distant. And they, I mean, it was a good experience for us as a, as a church. We had to cancel staff meeting last week. Uh, TJ got sick. Y'all need to say a little prayer for him. He's got a stomach thing going on. Uh, so we had to dismiss our staff meeting. We're going to have it today, but we'll, we're going to talk about it instead of having how to go forward uh, with this. Do we go forward? Uh, so be in prayer for your staff as we get together. Yeah. Yeah, so th this is Hunter. Yeah. yeah, Hunter hit a deer this morning. So on his way to where he's a driver for and delivery driver for Amazon, new delivery driver uh, for Amazon. So say a prayer for him. But it, it is good to be together today. Grateful for uh, this time to celebrate. It was a beautiful morning, wasn't it? I tell you what, it was just spectacular. Uh, the sunrise this morning is at, at our house, so I'm sure it was at yours too. Uh, let's stand together. We'll have a word of prayer. And. Uh, It's uh, good to see Brenda Long here with us this morning. Yeah. Father, we thank you for certain grace, dear Lord, and specific grace. That it's not a, your grace is not a shotgun kind of grace. It's, it's laser beam targeted to your children. And I, I thank you, dear Lord, that today we stand in the power of your grace. I thank you, Father, that your grace is is evident in every single day and moment of our lives. Lord, we thank you for protecting Hunter uh, this morning. And uh, Lord, I ask you to continue to bless him. Father, thank you for our church family, for their faithfulness on so many levels, dear Lord. Faithfulness to participate, faithfulness to worship, faithfulness in their tithing and, and continuing to do ministry as best as they can. Father, thank you for the level of commitment that exists among the people of South Jefferson. And pray, Father, that you would bless them as a people, bless us as a church. Father, use us to, uh, to be a light to this lost community that we may see many souls saved and uh, brought into your kingdom. Father, we're in your house to bring you honor and glory today that you might uh, speak to us, mold us, make us into the people that you'd have us to be. We surrender this time to you for your honor and your glory. It's in your son's name that we pray. Turn around and wave to people behind you. It's good to see Megan here too, all the way from P Preston, Pikeville, Kentucky. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. What a lovely day to gather together for worship. Let's be called to worship with a reading from the book of Psalms this morning. This is Psalm 31, and I'm going to read verses 21 through 24. Praise be to the Lord, for he showed me the wonders of his love when I was in a city under siege. In my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight. Yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Love the Lord, all his faithful people. The Lord preserves those who are true to him, but the proud he pays back in full. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. In those times when we feel like we are in a city under siege and we feel like we are out of God's sight, remember that that is never true. We are never out of his sight, and no matter where we are, he hears us when we call to him, and that is cause for praise and for celebration today. So we're going to answer the call of the psalm to love the Lord and uh, to be strong and take heart and hope in the Lord and express that to him today as we worship together. So let's sing together this morning, praise him, praise him.
are in a city under siege. We face spiritual warfare in our lives. We face hardships. We face fear and doubt. And it's at those times we want to remember that the God that the Bible calls the Lord of hosts, literally the Lord of the armies, the God of the armies of the Lord, that he is the one who is on our side. This is the God who goes before us and behind us and who never leaves us or forsakes us. Let's continue to praise him today and take comfort that the God of angel armies is always by our side. it this morning.
We're in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, just one verse. Uh, several weeks ago, I, uh, there was a day in which I, I, I attempted to phone as many members as I could uh, on a Monday and a Tuesday and just try to touch bases with everybody. I want to check on folks, to just to love on people, to see how they're doing, see if they had any needs, what was going on in their life, and just let them know that they're not forgotten. You know, because a lot of us are isolated at home during this time. And, and the conversations that, that I had with people, they really sounded a lot alike. And uh, a lot of folks expressing the same kind of ideas. And there were people who, who spoke earnestly with me really about fear, about being afraid of things and afraid of what's happening in our world. And they wanted to know, how do you have freedom from fear? Those conversations uh, moved my heart. And uh, my heart went out to so many people that I talked to sharing the same kind of idea. And that was what birthed this series of sermons, was just listening to the needs and and, and the, the, the hurt in, in my people. And those conversations led me to talk with Jacqueline about maybe changing the focus of our music. To, to We want to be theologically confessional in our singing, but we also want to sing praises to God and express our dependence upon Him. And so uh, the last few weeks, the, the songs, if you've noticed, have been more directed more toward our praise to God, our, our need of God in our life, like this song here, that there's nothing for us to fear. And that's really been our focus for the last several weeks. It's going to be our focus for several f- more weeks. But our, our world has changed. Our lives have changed. Uh, just, I know that your family is like our family and thinking about how to celebrate Thanksgiving. Uh, we're going to do a Zoom Thanksgiving. We're not meeting together as a family like we've done in years past. We're just, we're going to Zoom. And, and I mean, some of the family will be getting together, uh, but we won't be at, at the grandparents' house. We're going to Zoom it in, in that evening. So a lot of things have changed. And I know that, that at times we might get tossed into the, the depths of despair or, or fear. But still, the Bible in, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 has this to say, reading from the King James Version. It says, and read this with me. There is no fear in love, but lo- perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Those who experience fear can testify to the truth of this passage that fear is a tormentor. It's not just something around Halloween, but but whenever we're truly afraid or truly uh, gripped by something causing us to fear, it's a tormentor. And it it plays with our mind, plays with our heart, plays with our emotion. And it's possible or it's impossible for, for me to see into the hearts of those who long for release from fear. I just have to listen to their words and sense what they're saying to me. But, but now in truth, there are some that need to be afraid. Some because they've made a false profession of faith. And some are trying to hide their sins behind religious activities. There are others who have been truly born again, but Satan is robbing them of their peace, robbing them of their victory, and causing them to have doubts and fears. And so these situations require really some wisdom to navigate about what's going on. How do we get our head and our heart in the same place so that we're not living in fear? Now, as a pastor, I I have to discourage some of the false hopes that, that people carry. And yet, I want to encourage timid believers who find themselves experiencing fear. And it can rattle uh, some cages when a pastor talks about false professions of faith. But it's in Scripture. Matthew 7, 21, one of the scariest verses in the Bible to me is about false professions of faith. It says, not everyone who calls them to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's because there's some folks who pretend and, but according to Billy Graham, there are great numbers of church members in every church who are lost and are deceiving themselves. They're just pretending. Now, it's my duty as a pastor to warn folks, if I can, about that situation. But I also want to help and encourage those who are authentically saved in Jesus Christ. And that's the people I want to address today. Not those who've made a false profession of faith, although that's very real. And it's a dangerous place to be. 
But I want to talk to people who know Christ as their Savior and Lord and talk about what is there to fear as an authentic believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. In truth, Satan's favorite playground is the mind of Christians. He loves to get into our head. And Paul teaches us and helps us understand, so does John, that our, and Jesus Christ and his, and his temptations after the, the wilderness experience, that he loves to try to get in our heads and play around with our emotions and, and with our fears. And Satan will do everything that he can to disrupt the peace within God's children. And that includes you and me and your children and your grandchildren, that he really wants to disrupt the peace that you have because he knows if he can disrupt your peace, then you will begin to doubt God. And if you begin to doubt God, then you'll uh, become less faithful to God. And so he wants to do everything he can to cause us to fear. And, and the enemy in the form of fear, will do all that he can to disturb your peace. He's relentless. So let's talk about salvation for just a minute and how Satan might use salvation to create fear. Sometimes there's a misunderstanding about how it feels in the moment of salvation. Speaking to one of our, our, our church members, shared with me a concern that I don't know if I'm saved because I don't know if I feel like it. Now that's a legitimate fear. Or a legitimate question. And it can get confusing when we talk about salvation and we describe salvation in our salvation experience by how it made us feel. Now I'll tell you, I came to Jesus Christ and my coming to Christ was not an emotional coming. For me, it was a logical thing to do. That I came to God through my thinking. That it made sense to me to place my faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And I understood the consequences of not trusting in Christ as my Savior and Lord. So for me, to, my moment of salvation was very cognitive. I wasn't crying. I wasn't weeping. But I've been with people that do and have. And people have thrown up their hands and shouted. For me, that was not my experience. And so when that church member shared with me that they weren't sure if they were saved because they didn't have an emotional response like some people that they know, I could relate because as a young person, I had the same questions. Maybe I'm not saved because I, you know, I see them crying or them shouting or them raising their hands or I didn't have any of that. I got saved at a dining room table, my parents' dining room table. When I place my faith in Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. So when we talk about emotions at our point of salvation, instead of magnifying Jesus in our testimonies, sometimes we magnify feelings. And yes, salvation is a feeling. But instead of testifying to how to be saved by the Word, we, we, sometimes we tell people how we felt or how we might feel when we get saved. That's one reason why a lost person, instead of looking to Jesus for salvation, is focused on a feeling that they think that they ought to have at the moment of salvation. And when we focus on feelings, we may begin to wonder if we're truly saved. All people are saved alike. Every person who comes to faith in Jesus Christ comes to faith in Jesus Christ alike. But not everyone has the same feelings or the same emotional response at salvation. And salvation is not necessarily an emotional thing. It doesn't have to be, is what I'm trying to say. Outward actions depend largely upon our personalities. I'm more of an introvert. I'm real good to sit in the corner of a room and watch everything happen most of the time. That's just my nature. I don't have a lot of emotions. My, my grandmother would tell me, I want you to shout. And I'd say, when I'm preaching, I'm, it's not my nature to do that. I mean, I might get, raise my voice occasionally. It's not my nature to run around. That's just not how I'm wired. Some people are wired that way. And so their expressions of faith come and flow from their, our personality. So if your salvation experience aligns with Scripture, then you have nothing to fear. And the, the, there's no formula in Scripture, but Romans 10, 9, and 10 comes pretty close. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's a matter of fact. 
If you believe it and you say it and you confess it, then Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord and you are saved. Now, sometimes we begin to experience fear because we recognize that we're not living a perfect life. Or my family's not living a perfect life. As I was speaking with with members uh, during those those few days, those kind of sentiments began to be expressed to me. Now, some people lose their temper. Some people say things or do things for which they are ashamed that if the larger church population saw them expressing their emotions that way or using that kind of language, it would embarrass them. It would upset them. They realize how they've acted and how they've surrendered really to the devil, but they yield even more to Satan by by listening to the devil's jaunts and jeers. And Satan says things to us like, you're not a Christian, you can't be a Christian, Because look at what you've done. Again. You keep doing this over and over. There's no way. And we hear this in our head. Satan playing around in our mind telling us, there's no way that you're a Christian because you keep stumbling in this area of your life. You're not living the perfect life. You can't be a Christian or you wouldn't be doing that. I'm going to tell you, that's a bunch of baloney. Instead of confessing and believing God's promises of forgiveness... We end up convincing ourselves that we can't be God's child because we keep stumbling. You've heard me say before that I'm a lifelong limper. That didn't originate with me. There was this, in the first church that Stephanie and I ever served, there was a man named Mr. Robertson. He was a farmer. And he would come to the church with me, and we were in Henry County, and and he would help me open, my duty was to open up the church, turn on the heat, you know, do all that stuff. I uh, found out I was supposed to mow the grass too after we got there. But my job was to, to get the lights on every Sunday and every Wednesday. Well, Mr. Roberts would come and help me. And we would all, and there was a clock in the sanctuary, a grandfather clock that dinged at noon. And I, I almost got fired for it, but I moved the clock. Uh, you're not supposed to move the clock. <laughs> but um, because it would ding during worship service if I didn't get done right at noon. Me and Mr. Roberts would sit on that front row and we'd look at the baptistry and he would talk about life and faith and he was in his 90s. Helped me do that. And he would tell me, preacher boy, because that's what I was, they felt like that church's calling was to train preachers. And so that's what they did. They taught preachers how to be just a little country church, Henry County, Kentucky. But he's the one who said to me, he said, Brother Carver, He said, I've always been a lifelong limper. And he began to explain to me that he's always stumbled. He's always messed up. He's always said things he regretted and done things he regretted. But what he understood was that he kept walking faithfully with the Lord. Did you know Christians can walk with a limp? It's okay to be a lifelong limper. And for us, we have to understand that that as long as we live in these bodies... We will not be free from temptation. It's not going to happen. As long as we live in these bodies, we are never going to be able to live the perfect life. It's just not going to happen. There's no such thing as sinless perfection on this side of glory. We are all lifelong limpers. And yes, our desire should be to live as clean a life as we can. We want to be as free from sin as we can. But there's a vast difference from living a perfect life and living as clean a life as we can. There's a vast difference. You will never be able to live a perfect life. So when you hear Satan begin to whisper in your ears, there's no way you're a Christian because you keep messing up right here. That's just not true. We're all lifelong limpers. There's only one who's ever lived a perfect life on this earth, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we want to live as clean as we can. And Scripture calls us to live as clean as we can. That we should look different, smell different, talk different, walk different, drive different, eat different than the rest of the world. We should be different. But we don't have to be perfect. And Satan uses that idea of the perfect Christian just to steal our peace from us. And sure, the Bible teaches us that we are to live holy and blameless lives. But living above reproach is far different than perfection. See, God looks at our hearts. Our Savior knows what your weaknesses are. 
it doesn't surprise him when we stumble in areas of our life because God knows everything and he knows where we wrestle with Satan. He knows when we are beaten down by, and he understands, but he doesn't condemn us. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's just a bunch of baloney. Our Savior knows the frailties of our flesh. But that doesn't mean that God winks at sin. He expects us to confess our sin. That's why we have passages like 1 John 9 and 10, that if we confess our sins, and he's speaking to Christian people. This is not a verse to lost people. When John writes 1 John, he's writing to the church, to the beloved. And so he's telling Christians, Christian, when you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's a message to believers. God understands that we wrestle with sin. And He will not let us get away with sin. And to think that we can live any old way that we want is not the thinking of a truly saved person. Saved people shouldn't and can't think that way. The same grace that saves us is the same grace that helps us live righteous lives as righteous as we can every single day. And every true child of God wants to please their Savior. We want to make God happy. And sure, there are some who have stronger faith than others. And sure, there are some who walk closer to the Lord than other people. But all born-again believers, and if you've expressed your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that's you. All born-again believers were taught by God's grace to deny ungodliness. Is that easy to do? Absolutely not. It's hard living righteous lives. It's challenging. But that's what we strive for, to live as close to God and to walk as close to God as we can. So we, we, we have to take an inward look and ask questions like, do I come up short in the ideal Christian life? Do I want to live a clean and consecrated life? If you answered yes to those questions, that yes, or yes, I come up short, but yes, I strive to live the Christian life, then there's nothing to fear because you can't live perfectly, but you can live surrendered. You can walk with the Lord. Instead, determined by God's grace to live as blamelessly as you can. And as long as God's children are determined to fight against personal sin, there's nothing for us to fear because we're covered under the shed blood of Jesus Christ and God is watching. He's watching. Just keep in mind that Satan wages an all-out campaign to rob you of your peace and to take your victory from you. He's determined to rob you of your testimony. He's determined to steal your joy from you. He's determined to, to eliminate your godly influence. So never think for a moment that when you were saved that the devil just packed up his tents and walked away. It's actually the opposite. The moment that you professed your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, Satan actually waged an all-out war against you waiting for an opportune time. And we see that in Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ gained his victory after his baptism, spent the 40 days in the wilderness, what's the very first thing that Satan did? He attacked with three temptations. The moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ, and that's Satan's pattern, he waged an all-out war against you because he does not want you to be victorious. Now we'll come through the battle. We may be beat up a little bit, maybe bruised a little bit. We might walk with a limp. But thank God that we know that we always come out victorious on the other end of the battle because we're battling in the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. And you know that the Bible teaches that love is of God and that God is love. Love is a fundamental 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 characteristic of who God is. God is love and love flows from God. What that means is that everything that God does is filled and influenced by his love. Everything that he does is influenced by love. 
And there's a distinct word for the type of love that God uses to demonstrate his concern and care. And in the Greek, and you know this word, it's the word agape. And agape is that kind of love that's benevolent. It's self-sacrificing. It's charitable. So that that kind of love seeks the very best for the one to whom the love is directed. And that's to you and to me and to our families. 1 John 4, 18 says that perfect love casts out fear. That word to cast in the original language is what you would do with a baseball. You throw it as far as you can, as hard as you can. You're throwing from from the outfield all the way to home plate. I mean, just as far and as hard as you can. Now, this verse says that, that there is no fear in love, but that perfect love casts out that fear. It throws it away. It is gone because fear has torment. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now, the context here is important. John is writing to Christian people. He's telling Christian people, if you are living and you are afraid, then you don't understand God's love because if you understood God's love as a child of God, there would be no fear because he tells us, John tells the believer in the last part of verse 18 that fear has not been made, or or that that the ones who have fear have not been made mature, perfect in God's love. What John is saying is you need to get a better understanding of God's love. Because if we're living in fear, and John's talking about fear of judgment, that'd be the greatest fear of all. But I think we could say any kind of fear. The context is important. In verse 17 from the International Version, it says that this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. And this is how love is made complete. In this world, we're like Jesus. In this world, you are like Jesus. In this world, you're vindicated. In this world, you're judged. But in this world, you're set free. In this world, you are God's child, dearly loved. We're like Jesus in this world. And if we're like Jesus in this world, then there is no fear in love. If we are like Jesus in this world, then perfect love has cast out all of our fear. If we are like Jesus in this world, fear no longer has torment over our thoughts and our hearts and our minds. And if we are like Jesus in this world, then we have been made perfect in God's love directed to us. The context is important. Now, the fear that perfect love casts out certainly is the fear of judgment. And we all know that judgment day is coming. But those who are in Christ know God's love today, in this moment, now. And God's love drives away all fear of any kind of condemnation. And the dismissal of the fear of judgment is one of the main functions of God's love. Anyone without Christ is under judgment and has plenty to fear. But once a person wants you placed yourself in Christ through faith in Him as Savior and Lord, the fear of judgment is gone because we are permanently reconciled to God. When we are permanently reconciled to God, there is nothing to fear because greater is He who's in you than he who's in the world. Now, part of understanding God's love is knowing that God's judgment fell upon Jesus on the cross so that we might be spared. That's why Jesus came. The Bible says that nothing can separate the believer from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus. That means that God's love doesn't ebb and flow. It means that God's love is not fickle. It doesn't mean that that God's love is up one day and down the next based upon our choices, whether they be good or bad. It means God's love remains the same regardless of what we do because God loves you and when he loves you there's nothing to fear I read my quiet time this morning in Luke 
So you know I'm reading the, the Bible through again this year. But in Luke, it was the, the story of the, the owner who gave his servants minas to work with. And he expected them to take those minas and to grow them and to use them. And when God, or when the owner came back and asked his servants what they do, one of the, the, the servants had his t- ten minas had increased ten more minas. The one who had five minas had increased five minas. One of them said, I know that, that, that you, you reap where you have not sow and you take what you want. And I was afraid, and so I hid my minna, and I'm returning this one minna to you. And the master said, well, you should at least put it on interest. But as it is, I'm going to take your minna from you and give it to someone else. Even in situations like that, God's love does not ebb and flow. It doesn't ebb and flow. God's love for sinners is why Christ died on the cross. If God had not loved sinners, remember Jesus died for sinners. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. He did not die for elected people. He didn't die for predestined people. He died for dirty, sinful people who were not yet redeemed who had not yet placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for me while I was still a sinner. He died for you while you were still a sinner. He died on that cross for sinners because God loved sinners. If God had not loved sinners, Jesus would not have come. But because God loved lost people, he sent his son. And God's love for those lost people who trust in Jesus Christ is why God holds us in his hand and promises never to let us go. Never. And that divine love takes away every fear. Every fear. The story from Luke 14 tells us that one day, We're going to give an accounting for our lives. God tells us, though, to not be afraid. He tells us to not be afraid of being alone. Scripture tells us to not be afraid of being too weak. Scripture tells us that we should not be afraid of not being heard in our prayers. And we should not be afraid of presidential elections or pandemics. The key to overcoming fear is total trust and complete trust in God because God loves. Trust is how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced the fiery furnace without fear. Those three young men didn't have a drop of fear in their bodies. They said, God will do what God will do, but we're not going to bow down. We're not going to do it. And those three men, young men, placed complete faith in God in the middle of a fiery furnace. Trusting God is how Stephen stood before his killers fearlessly. As Paul took off his cloak, Scripture tells us, and laid it aside, and he was the first one to begin, or Saul, before it was Paul, was the first one to begin to stone Stephen, to kill him by throwing rocks at him. That's how you stone somebody. You picked up rocks about the size of grapefruits and you threw them at them as hard as you can and you kept throwing those rocks until you killed them. Trust is how Stephen stood before his killers fearlessly in the book of Acts. Trust is how Daniel walked around in a lion's den without any fear. In trust is how you will navigate this world in which we live. We're not in a fiery furnace. We're not being stoned. And we're not being pursued by lions. Not like Daniel was. Folks, there's nothing to fear. Don't let Satan get in your mind and rob you of your fear. To trust God is to refuse 
to give in to fear. Even in the darkest times, we can trust God to make things right. And this trust comes from knowing God and knowing that God is good. He's always good. And once we've learned to put our trust in God, we'll no longer be afraid of the things that cross our paths or interrupt our lives because perfect love casts out fear. And you are a recipient of that perfect love today because of your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So don't fear. Don't let Satan tell you your salvation's false. Don't let Satan tell you that you can't be a Christian because you're not living a perfect life. Don't let Satan tell you or try to convince you that God doesn't love you. Understand that you are loved and precious to God. How do you know that? Because precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And scripture tells us that heaven erupts with joy every time a saved person crosses from this life into eternity. That's how you know. Because God cannot wait to say to you, I've been waiting on you. Well, welcome home. We're going to sing a hymn invitation. And this morning, if you're finding yourself in a place of fear, throw it away. Perfect love casts out fear. Let's stand together as we sing.
good to be together uh, this morning, and I, I, I pray and I, I trust and I, and I hope that we will never surrender to become people of fear. Certainly, we want to be cautious and be careful and be wise and judicious, and, but folks, there's nothing to be afraid of. And wearing a mask doesn't mean you're afraid, it just means you're smart. You're using modern medical science to get, lead you and guide you, and that's wisdom. So I'm not suggesting that things like this aren't essential or social distancing. I'm not at all suggesting that. I'm saying live wisely, but never live in fear. There is no fear. Let's read this verse together. May the Lord keep watch between you and me when we're away from each other. Amen. God bless you. Jacqueline. Let's close in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, as we leave this place today, help us take encouragement um, from John's words that if we acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, that God lives in us and we in him. And Lord, let that be a source of strength and encouragement to us when we face trials, Lord, when, when we're like the psalmist this morning, when we're in a city under siege. And help us not to be afraid in those times, Lord. You are in us and we are in you. And nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Savior. It's in his name we pray today. Amen.